Oh, praise the Lord. What a beautiful service we had last night. Um, part of that is because of your labor of love that you're doing here on the campground. It's amazing how much fun you can have working for the Lord, isn't it? His ways are perfect, and uh, he always can produce perfect results if we do it his way. Some of you probably don't know who I am. I'm Brother Finnegan, and I, I stood in this place several years ago every work week and had the privilege of speaking to the young people, about their purpose. Now we have these brethren that took my place uh, doing a marvelous job. Um, but I did feel the Holy Ghost uh, say something to you. We're going to be speaking out of the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, starting with verse 12. I think you're a, a very special generation. God has had special generations throughout history. Um, he has a tendency to repeat himself over and over again throughout history, and seems like each time he does, he, he gets a harvest out of the earth. Um, the fruit grows on the tree, it ripens, and then he harvests that fruit. And uh, it takes uh, special circumstances, events in the world, to create that environment to produce that harvest. You're living in a time when those circumstances are ripening all around you. Um, I don't know how many of you contemplated or thought about that service last night and about what God was doing. There's very few groups in the whole earth that get to experience what you got to experience last night. They just <clears throat> had a revival at one of the college campuses. And that was noised abroad in the whole world. People came from all over the world. And I was watching on, uh, I think it was Facebook, I don't know where it was, but I was in Honduras. And I was curious at what it was, what God was doing. You know, I'd like to know what God's doing everywhere. And I wouldn't want to miss what God's doing somewhere. Uh, because we're still looking, aren't we, for certain things, certain ingredients to complete this work that God is doing in the earth. So I was very curious if God was doing something. You know, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a good practice to close your mind to what God might be doing somewhere else in the world, thinking that the only place he's going to do it is through us. We'd make a terrible mistake if we did that. Israel did that. They had an image of what Jesus was going to be and how Jesus was going to operate and that he, that he wasn't going to go to the um, Gentiles and God threw them a curveball. They weren't looking for it and he threw it. And they swung and missed, and it cost them their nation, and even to this day, they haven't been restored spiritually. So I don't, uh, I wouldn't want that to happen to us, and specifically, I don't want it to happen to me as an individual. So I want to keep my eyes and ears open 
to what God is doing because it's unlikely that he's only going to do it through us. That's very, pretty unlikely, church. Um, God loves the world. That's my subject today, that God loves the world that he, he gave his only begotten son because he loves the world. Not just me and you. Not just the body of Christ that we know. He loves the world. So let me, let me read this, and then I'll talk about it for a few minutes, okay? What, I, what I'd like you to do is just take a moment here, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. I want you to quiet yourself for a moment. You know, we live in a noisy world. Our brethren have been talking about, you know, the cell phone and modern media. And it makes a lot of noise, doesn't it? And you're a generation that's used to all that noise. You hardly can stand not having it, whether it's music um, whether it's being occupied with some kind of digital game, um, whether it's texting, um, whether it's reading what's going on around you somewhere. And I'm not saying all that is bad. Uh, it's just that it's noisy. And God isn't very noisy. He speaks in a Still, small voice. He's not going to yell at you. He's not your parents. My parents had to yell at me a few times to get my attention. If that didn't work, they used a stick. That was needful. I never regretted that. That, that was necessary. But that isn't how God has ever spoke to me. He didn't use a stick. He didn't yell, but somehow, some way, he spoke to my heart, and I heard it. It was so soft, but wow, so powerful, unshakable. You know, the voice of God inside of you is unshakable. The beauty is he doesn't just say it once, thank God, but he says it to you over and over and over, and you can't shake that, that sense you have that God's asking you to do something, that God's wanting something from you. Last night, what God did for you was because he wants something from you. I'm sorry, but he doesn't want you to live an ordinary life. You know, I say this in Honduras. I said, he, God isn't interested in you just making tortillas having some refried beans and doing dishes and digging ditches or laying brick. All that's necessary. Don't get me wrong. You, you know, it's all part of life, but it isn't life. And you're never, ever going to feel that longing in your soul with those things. Those things you're going to do while you're filling your soul with what really counts. And there is something that really counts and that is what he wants you to find he's wooing you last night God was courting you he was sending you a bouquet of flowers or uh, giving you a little love note uh, he was looking at you a certain way that would catch your attention because it was just in a, you know, those brethren that got up did a wonderful job and they were anointed and I was so thankful for that. We need such a generation. Listen, this generation is going to have to be a passionate generation. You're going to have to be, the word of God is going to have to be a fire set up in your bones and it's going to have to consume you. Because what you're going against, the power that you're going to be going against is mighty. It's, 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 it's reaching a climax in the earth, and you're going to have to have an equal or greater force to conquer it. Those of you that know the 
laws of thermodynamics, you know it takes a, uh, one force has to have another force equal or greater to it. Well, you're facing something that's coming on this earth right now, and it's a force, it's a power. It has tremendous influence. It never sleeps. It's always around you. It's constantly pounding on your mind and your heart and surrounding you. And it's going to get louder and louder. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to take a generation that can sound a trumpet so powerful. You know, it said, it said and there was a strong angel. It's going to take a strong angel. Those are messengers. And... and Young ladies, uh, it takes girl messengers too. In the resurrection, you're not going to be a female. There's neither male nor female in the resurrection. You're going to be a celestial. And I'm going to tell you, if you're faithful doing what God calls you to do as a female right here on this earth, you'll reign with him. And you might... Get some revenge. I know you wouldn't want to, but you might get some revenge and get to boss some of these boys around. <laughs> but let me read this. We're going to start with verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. We are debtors. You know, last night you got in debt to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did, for that sweet spirit that you felt last night for that wooing of the heart, for the satisfying of the longing of the soul, the, the reason that you are created, the reason that you were formed in your mother's womb, the reason that you breathe and you have your being. See, there's a purpose. You've got to understand there is a purpose for you, a very high calling for you, a reason that you're here. It's not by accident. It's planned by the Creator. And His timing is absolutely perfect every single time. He said, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, that means to sever the nerve or cut off, do mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. It's kind of simple, isn't it? One way you're going to die, the other way you're going to live. It's, it's very simple. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know, I had the young people in Honduras because they are in a third world country. They have kind of a depressed state of mind. I had them sing that you're a child of the king. You know that every single one of you is a child of the king? You're the king's children. You're being asked to come into his palace, inherit his substance, carry his name. Wow, what a phenomenal responsibility. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, <laughs> whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You've been adopted into, into the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we need to claim that adoption and we need to claim those riches. We need to, we need to you know, write it down. You know, you, you need to write down what you've received from the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to write down the promises of God. You need to, you need to communicate to yourself first because you can't become something you can't see. You've got to see who you want to be. You need to write down what it is you want to become. Make it clear so you can see it. I was talking to one of the young men. You have more energy and more strength while you're young than you're ever going to have. When do Olympic champions become Olympic champions? When they're 35? No, they're almost all out by then. No, it's young. Some of those female gymnasts are, what, 14, 16 years old, and they become gold medalists. How did they do that? I'll tell you how they did that. They didn't waste their youth. 
their youth was very focused and very concentrated on, what it, on their objective, whatever that objective was. For us... Our objective, we're not striving for a natural crown, a natural medal. We're striving for something supernatural. But yet, are we giving all of our time and our energy and our strength to what we are striving for? Or do we find ourselves squandering the great power and strength that we have, which is called our youth, do we find ourselves squandering that aimlessly with, because we don't have direction and focus on what it is we want through Jesus Christ in life? And it's specifically what he wants for us. For if, if children then heirs and heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, and if so be we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together if we suffer with him. I know everybody likes to escape suffering, but you're not going to escape it one way or the other. Suffering's coming on the earth. There's a woman that's pregnant, and her birth pangs are coming. They're, you can feel them. And she's going to deliver a baby. And I'm telling you, you're a generation that's getting ready to deliver something, and God's trying to prepare you for that delivery. So let's go here in verse 18, because this hit me while I was in Honduras. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed to us. Now, the difference between them and you is they were suffering persecution. They were dying for Christ. Uh, they were being burnt at the stake, uh, imprisoned, tormented. All kinds of things were happening. Which, By the way, there's Christians all over the world that are experiencing that right now. And they do it so marvelously and so wonderfully. And if you don't read those biographies, you really should. I know people don't like to read that stuff. My grandchildren have a tendency to want to shy away from it because it makes, you know, the reality of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ too, too bitter for them. Because, man, this is, the, this is the life here. Following Jesus in America is the life, isn't it? I mean, you know, we... we we get to have everything. Yet the rest of the world is giving up everything to have him. Truth of the matter is, you can be a Christian in this country and give up nothing. Let's be honest. How we live in Christ, is, do, you, do you feel like that? Like you're suffering living for Jesus the way you live? You like being a modest girl, don't you? You're a good, clean, moral, godly girl, and you love it. It's not suffering for you, it's joy. This life is joy. It's so precious and so good. The loving family that you have. I told your dad, I said, I feel sorry for the boy that dates your daughters because you've courted them and loved them and nurtured them and cared for them. And, you know, now they expect, they're going to expect that. <laughs> Dad's going to expect that. <laughs> But isn't that beautiful? See, serving the Lord in our country is a very lovely thing because it doesn't cost us anything. But unfortunately, it creates an illusion. It does. Because if we suffer with Christ, we will reign with Christ. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest, this is what I want to, I want you to hear this because I want this to hit you. I want this to hit you. I want to hit everybody in this room. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What does that mean to you? I'm going to tell you what it means. The whole earth is waiting for you to do what God's called you to do. The whole creation's groaning. And I'm sorry, but we can't contain this to ourselves. The whole creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. You are the sons of God. The whole earth is groaning, suffering all around you. One million children are being sold 
in human trafficking every year, one million children are being sold. They're being abducted, drugged, and then sold on the open market like cattle. A million of them. How many of you have ever prayed for any of those kids? I watched a Christian film because in Bedford, Virginia, just about 15 miles from us, that happened. A Christian father had his daughter in a Christian school. And uh, I don't know how many years ago, might have been about 10 years ago, she was abducted. And uh, it's a phenomenal film because he goes into the church and he just breaks down and cries all alone. And he starts yelling at God. You know, it's okay to yell at God sometimes. When you get frustrated, you know that God loves you and he wants to be your friend and he wants to know you intimately. And sometimes you need to go in your room and just start talking to him and telling him how you feel. Tell him you're angry because mom and dad failed or uh, somebody did this or, or, or because, because you feel like your temptation's too great. You, know, you need to get in your room and talk to God like your best friend. And he comes into the church and he just falls down at the altar and he says, I don't understand. You, you, I, I don't get this. I've raised my children exactly the way you asked me to. My daughter goes to a Christian school. I've taught her to love you and to serve you, and I have no idea why you would ever allow this to happen to my daughter. This makes no sense, and it doesn't answer any of the promises you promised me. And he pours himself out to God. Well, do you know what happens? God hears him, and God finds her, and God rescues her, and she gets saved before they get her out on that open market, because God heard his cry. But let me tell you, that's happening all over the world. It's happening all over the world that people are in darkness right now, and they have no idea. How many people on planet Earth has heard this message of overcoming the flesh? Follow, walking in the spirit and that we can be like Jesus. How many people know that? Yet they're dying all around you. And, and can I ask you a question? Do any of you care? Has it ever burdened any of you? Do you have you ever been called on your knees to pray for those people? Have you ever shed a tear for them? Or is it that we're so preoccupied with adolescence and with this? Or, you, you know, sometimes, church, the reason why we're so frustrated and we feel so hollow and so empty and, and, and we don't have, we, you know, we don't really know the answers, it's because we're not seeking the answers in the right way. It's because we're seeking things from a very selfish standpoint. It's because we're, we haven't really told God, listen, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll communicate to anybody. And, and you know, people really kind of get a little critical toward me because I, I believe in missions, but I believe your mission is your neighbor. I, you know, I don't think you have to go around the world to find a mission field. But I don't think you're doing that either. Let's just be honest. I don't think the average church is completely burdened with the fact that people are dying all around them and we're spending very little time weeping for them or crying for them and seeking God for them. We're just letting them die because we are not burdened for them. But the Bible says that the entire creation is groaning for you waiting for you to manifest yourself under the anointing of God, under the, by the word of God, with the love of God in your heart. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by the reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I don't know if we see what it is God wants us to do, what this is all about. I'm sorry, it's not just all about who you're going to marry. It's not just all about what kind of house you're going to have or what career you're going to have. I'm not saying those things aren't important. I believe in them, really, I do. 
But I believe that the purpose behind every single bit of that is to help this creature that is bound by sin, bound by the curse, bound in blindness. It is to help them be liberated through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're a generation of young people that if you find that purpose, if you find it, I was called of God at 12 years old. He spoke to me and called me to preach. God can talk to you. He's no respecter of persons. He can speak to your heart. And I'm telling you right now, people are dying. You know, it's a small thing to die in, in the faith. You know, we really get all bent out of shape and weep and mourn. And, uh, and I understand. But I'm going to tell you, you ought to be rejoicing when somebody dies in the faith. Because they receive the reward. This life is very temporary. We make it, we make it so important, right? He, if you get a little pimple on your face, you know, I'm like, the world just came to an end, right? I mean, everybody sees it. Everybody notices it. You wish. The truth of the matter is, most people aren't paying that much attention to you. You're the one that's paying that much attention to you because you love you. But they're not. You're just another face, another person. Let me tell you, if we will channel, you know, here's what uh, I want to say to you. I'm gonna, I want to uh, challenge you. I want to challenge you to, when you go home, to get in your room and ask God what he wants you to do with your life. I want you to start seeking his face and ask him, why have you made me? What plans do you have for me? Here I am, Lord. Use me. Have you told the Lord that? Have you asked him to use you? Have you gone into your room and got down on the floor? I had a um, young girl from Honduras come and stay with us for a year. And I had, it, it's not, you can ask my grandchildren, it's not always fun to be with grandpa. Because I'm constantly telling them that God wants to do something with their life and that they're not their own, but they're bought with a price. And you want to know the truth? They don't always want to hear that. They just want to be a kid. But the truth of the matter is people are dying all around them while they're being a kid. You know, so you're in a room full of dying children and you have the cure, but you're going to tell them, I'm so sorry. I just want to be a kid. You know, nobody here would do that. I know you wouldn't do that. I know my grandchildren, if they were in a room full of dying infants and they all needed, they all needed milk and there was the bottles of milk over there, I know every one of my grandchildren would go grab the bottle of milk, grab that little baby and stick that bottle in the mouth and feed that baby. I know they would. The problem is they don't see that that's really happening in the spirit. And the reality is whether they're a teenager or not, it doesn't matter, they're still going to die. The whole creation's groaning. And you can say, I'm just going to wait till I grow up and become an adult because right now I'm just going to chill and enjoy my life. You can do both because you want to know the truth that that dying person needs a friend. That person that needs Jesus, that person that has no answers. And you know, there's kids, you can imagine how many girls out in your, in your own town, your own neighborhood, have nobody. I'm telling you, they have nobody. When I work in Honduras, do you know that about 99% of those people I work with have never heard somebody say, I love you? It's not spoken in their home. 
They didn't learn it. And here's what's weird. You'd think that the moment you say I love you to them, they're going to say, ah, oh, just what I've always been waiting for. No, they don't. They don't know what to do. Because they've never had it. It's not what you think. You actually have to teach them how. First of all, you have to teach them that they actually are missing it, okay? It's never happened to you, so you don't, you don't realize it, but you, you're empty because of that. Then you got to teach them how to receive love. They don't just automatically receive it. You have to teach them how. Sometimes they'll push you away because they don't know. They've never had it. I just want to, you know, I, I was watching last night, and I know God's not doing that for no reason. Listen, he's not fattening you up just for you to sit. God doesn't operate that way. God is wooing you for a reason. And honestly, it's time for you to ask him what that reason is. It's time for you to begin to seek him with your whole heart. Not just as your savior, but as your Lord. Uh, I was listening to a missionary the other day, and he said, most Christians know Jesus as their Savior. Very few know him as their Lord. The difference between Jesus being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord, as your Savior, you get to come to him and ask him for this and that, and, you know, oh, God, I need you to do this, and God, forgive me for this. And, 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 and what does he do when you do that? He opens his arms wide and says, I am your Savior. I will do all those things. But man, I wish you'd make me your, your Lord because I have something I really want you to do, but you're not going to do it until I'm your Lord, until you say whatever you ask, whatever you want, whatever you say, I surrender everything to you. I belong to you. You purchased me with your blood I'll close with this. There's three things that I found that people in history had that gave everything to Jesus. Three things. I think you should write them down. Number one, they believed the word of God was written to them. They believed the word of God was written to them. When they read it, it was personal. God's talking to me. Number two, they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They knew that he suffered for them I'll say it again. They accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Number one, they knew the Word of God was written personally to them. Number two, they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. And they recognized because he suffered for them, they also in like manner must suffer with him. They recognize that. You know, we're, st we're to follow in his steps. And what was his steps? You might need to go back and reevaluate what the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ were because what they were was becoming a servant to humanity, to the people around him. You know, he came to the Jew first, but those Gentiles kept knocking on the door. Lord, could you please heal my child? Woman, it's not right for me to give the food from the master's table to dogs. Wow. Can you imagine that insult? Jesus Christ, the one that you think would never insult anybody, just told that woman, in her hour of need, by the way, she was desperate. She needed something from God. And he said, I'm not going to give 
what I have to dogs. Wow. Hmm. But you see, she had the right spirit. She knew she was a dog. She knew she was unworthy. She knew she didn't deserve anything from him. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Gentile. And she said, Lord, aren't even the dogs worthy of the crumbs that fall from the master's table? And Jesus was like blown totally away. Woman, your faith has moved my father to hear your request. They knew that what Jesus did for them, they must do also for him. Number three, this is so important. They loved the people that the Lord Jesus Christ sent them to the same way he loved them. One of the young men went to Korea. His long, many years ago. And Korea at that time was did not allow any foreigners or any Bibles into their country. If you were a foreigner and you entered Korea, or if you had a Bible in Korea, you were going to be killed. And this young man uh, smuggled some Bibles in, and he barely escaped. Barely, he just got out of there. Barely got out of there. And he went back, and you know, the Holy Spirit started dealing with him again, and he got a bunch of Bibles back together, and these other Koreans that, he had, that had helped him go over there said, you can't, you're, you're, you'll die if you come over. He said, I have to. I'm being compelled to go take these Bibles to those lost people. And as he was giving out his last Bible, he was killed. And the emperor grabbed it. They destroyed every Bible that he had sent over. Every single Bible got burnt that he had sent over. The last one the emperor himself took. And he, he had a room full of trophies. And he decided that this Bible was going to be a trophy. So he tore every single page out of that Bible and put it on his wall. Every single page was put on the wall. A few years later, the emperor was conquered. His trophy room was abandoned. There was a little boy standing there when he gave that last Bible out, and he watched that missionary be killed. That little boy grew up and bought that building. When he bought that building, that Bible was still there, and he used that Bible to evangelize Korea. And over 200,000 people were saved through the process of that work that that little boy started. That young man that died never saw that. He never saw the reward. Let me tell you something. God did. And the day's going to come when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to say, come here. I want to show you something. I want to show you who you affected. You know, you don't always see what you're going to do in this lifetime. Just do it by faith. But young people, realize that God has a plan for you. And it's not just flesh and blood. It's not just natural. It's supernatural. You're called to something great. Open your heart and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you and guide you and guide your life for his wonderful purpose. God bless you.
Right, who did that? Who did that? Oh, come on, fess up. Who did that? Come on up, up here. Come on up here. Right, come on up here. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. Right. One, two, three. Go! Here we go. All right, come on. One, two. Good morning. Good morning. All right, go sit down. I got some homework for you. I'm going to make this quick. That's what you're waiting for, right? Is homework. Write this name down. Robert Germain Thomas. Write that name down. Robert Germain Thomas. And sometime after you leave this campground, I hope you keep the notes that you're taking. Look that up and read about that. Because he's the guy that Brother Fenneken was just talking about. And when he died, he wasn't an old man. He was 26 years old when he gave his life. It, it, it's good inspiration because we are not here on our own mission we're not here for what we can get out of it. We're here because we've been made part of a kingdom. We've been made part of a kingdom. All right. Just got a few things for y'all this morning. Um, who is leaving in the morning, Thursday morning? Can you raise your hand? Good, that's great, tremendous. All right, uh, so, so I wanted to say this morning, thank you for another good day. We haven't, we haven't hurt anybody, we haven't lost anybody, and we're getting a lot of work done. Count that as wins all the way around. All right, um, if, remember if you have pictures, uh, Brother Otino, you gave that number out yesterday, right? The number Brother Otino gave out, uh, send your pictures there so they can use them to post. All right, remember, uh, return when you return your tools. This is really important this week. When you return your tools, return them clean. Uh, return them clean. That way the folks in the garage don't have to do that for you. Uh, Okay, return anything you're not using, anything you, you're finished with, return that to the, to the garage. Okay, that, that's for the tool cleaning. Yeah, you can do that right at the garage. Or if you're someplace, you've got another water point around you where you can rinse the shovel off or rinse the tools off. Uh, but you could for sure do it over there because they have a hose with a, with a sprayer on it. All right, uh, we're going to deploy another crew to Stone Street. Uh, Brother Puckett's going to be taking them down there, and we want to go ahead and get y'all on the road. So as I call your name, uh, please go ahead out. Uh, Bailey Rhodes, uh, Ella Valio, Patience Rowe, Alice McElroy, Anna McElroy, Hannah Puckett, Gracie Patrick, Kimberly Hannah, Constantina Benincasa, Esther Fenecum, come on, give me some appreciation on that name. <laughs> Esther Fenecum, Haley Davis, Luke Sumner, uh, Brother Foy, there you go, uh, Ethan Champagne, 
Zachary, no, we're not sending Zachary, are we? Zachary's staying here. All right, Caleb Hamilton, Judah Larickia, Jeremy Pierce, Hunter Davis, Silas Finnecum, Jason Rogers, Marla Michelle, Noah, uh, Bilance, Michael Wooten, Malachi Wooten, and Darian Martin. All right, that's our group that's going. All right, are y'all already in your teams? Everybody already in your team? All right, you ready, Brother Otino? All right, where's my painting crews? All right, brother, you ready for your painting crews? I need to do, make an announcement. Hang on for just one minute. Looking at his face reminded me I need to make this announcement. For y'all that are playing the bass guitar or playing the drums, I want y'all to meet with Brother Dillinger at band practice tonight. So even if you don't play a band instrument, if you play a ba the bass or the drums, meet with Brother Dillinger at band practice tonight. All right. Who are my painting crews? All right. Go with Brother Dillinger. Who's my yard crews? All right. Go with Sister Latino. If you're if you were working in the dining room this morning, you need to report to the dining room. Hold on real quick before you girls leave. Which teams, which rows of teams have not worked in the dining room yet? Yeah, yeah, I made one for you. <laughs> 